sometimes I go to sleep wishing for a dream with the two of us in conversation. If only for him to affirm that we are still on the right path on our way to true self-determination. I imagine myself walking up a stairway to the heavens where Steve and other greats gather and contemplate the state of our nation. With my presentation folded neatly under my arm, I am so ready to state our case and show him our successes. I want to tell him that we have finally made it, that we now sit at the same table as the white people, that we have the same power they have to make decisions over the direction our country should take. But before I can press the play button on my mind, Umtina has already figured me out. And with a mischievous yet knowing smile, he says, how many of you sit at the table? How many have been locked out? And how many have you discredited or killed to secure your place at this table? Furthermore, have you no wood to make a table long enough to accommodate all of you and made according to your own specifications? For how long will you be satisfied with the invitation of a few who will no sooner betray your cries for their own immediate benefit? Do you not see, my dear child, that you are becoming like crabs in a bucket playing the survival game? Must I show any pride for your self-centeredness disguised with my people's real frustration and need to reclaim their identity? But Steve, I spring up in response. Everything takes time. Our democracy is only 26 years old and we are only now getting to enjoy the fruits of the generation of learners that received the quality education of the whites. Now you see, therein lies our hope. With the children of the soil who from elementary have stood shoulder to shoulder with the whites. They, Kamela, they are not at all traumatized by what most of your generation has had to suffer. They are not scared of the white man. They are not intimidated by his fancy language. In fact, they speak it just as well, if not better than him. This young generation, they don't see color. All their matters are handled with rationality and merit. Now, if anybody can tell a good story about us, it is Generation X. At this point, I can only read approval on his face as he sits back, taking a moment to ponder these valid points I've just made. A regality in his energy as he stands up tells me that my hero respects my opinion and is about to say, well done. Unexpectedly, a hearty belly laughter belts out of him and then more questions flow. This generation you speak of, Maskosan, them who speak the white man's language better than him. Your hope, these children of the soil, are they as well versed in the language of their own people? And yes, they stood shoulder to shoulder with the whites, but on whose terms? Are these not the same children who were crying for the right to go to school as themselves with their natural hair as their crowns? If I remember well, the whole country was at a standstill because being who we are is still a matter of political discussion in our homeland. And are you, sure, are you sure they don't see color? Because from where I stand, they seem to understand the color dynamics of our country better than the previous generation. These are the same people who have resorted to bleaching their skin to earn a better position in their workplaces, in their communities and in social circles. I would say this generation needs to be retaught basics like black is beautiful. Or is that a mantra that died with me back in 77? You see, if you had built your own schools, these lessons of pride would have made it into your curriculum with ease. Now there's real power. True freedom and change begins in your mind, not in the thoughts and ideas borrowed from those who once blatantly oppressed you. But there you still all are at the station, waiting for the white man's train to deliver to you an education that you somehow believe will be for your betterment. I am defeated. I am deflated. 
At this point, I am looking around for anything that can save face. So I present to him evidence of myself reading. I write what I like. I show him a history of my research on black consciousness. I go as far as showing him my social media pages to show him that I am woke. A loser's weak attempt at gaining the approval of her hero. And as expected, he shakes his head in disappointment. His respect and love still stamped strongly in his heart. My people, he says, those who need to see those woke updates, they can't even afford to walk these Twitter streets as you so refer to them. They are out in the real streets scraping away for tonight's supper. And you being woke on your own is of no value if it is not translated to the many everyday people who are dying from the abuse of drugs and alcohol, suffering the indignity of being unseen and unheard, and are at the risk of being a motherless nation for the number of black women who are dying on a daily. So when you have it in your report that black men finally understand their role in society and the importance of building the black family. Worry not, I will take a walk into your dreams myself. But for now, here's a thing to remember. Steve Miko does not want you to recite, I write what I like. I just want you to live your life in a way that does not delete your space in the narration of our history. I want you to embrace each other, to show black love one to the other, even in your weakest moments. You still have time. So go, live, and tell. That was absolutely amazing. Thank you so much, Sister Lelechu. Thank you for giving us a very, very um, fitting opening to today's conversation. You have reminded us of the importance of black consciousness in the current context in which we live in. I would like to now hand over to the Vice Chancellor of the University of the Nelson Mandela University to officially welcome everyone to this 10 um, legal lecture. Professor Sibongi Lemutwa, please over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Zandile, uh, for this uh, opportunity. It is my privilege, colleagues, to welcome all of you who have joined us uh, online for this memorial lecture. It is my privilege and my pleasure to greet our distinguished scholar, our very own Professor Ibo Mandaza, who is our keynote speaker for this afternoon, and Professor Simplue Sante, our colleague, who is the respondent for this afternoon. I greet the Deputy Vice Chancellors uh, who are here present, uh, the members of uh, the academic community, the professors, uh, the students that are here from our universities and from schools, uh, the Azapo leadership, as well as the whole cadre of the Black Consciousness Movement that are here this afternoon. This august audience, colleagues, would be keenly aware that today, the 12th of September 2020, is 43 years since the brutal murder of Stephen Bantubiko in 1997. As we commemorate his life, snuffed out at the hands of the illegitimate apartheid regime, may we also remember today the life of advocate George Bezos, a justice warrior who defended so many, including black consciousness activists. Uh, advocate Bezos passed away, as you know, earlier this week on Wednesday, the 9th September 2020. We salute his life. We are proud and humbled as Nelson Mandela University that this is the 10th year that we are hosting the Steve Bantubigo Memorial Lecture. I wish to recall those who have honored us as speakers over the years since the, in the inception of these commemorative lectures from 2011 onwards. Uh, these uh, comrades are Dr. Mosibudi Mangena, Professor Itumeleng Musala, Mr. Pandelani Nevalovotwe, 
Mr. Peter Jones, Advocate Mujangu Gumbi, uh, Dr. Matata Tzedu, Professor Muleti Kete Asante, uh, Dr. Andy Lema Africa, as well as a cohort of younger cadres and students who have participated in more dialogic panel settings in recent years. I thank you all for having graced us in this manner. I wish to extend Pro Program Director our well wishes to Peter Jones, who is recovering from a debilitating stroke last year. You continue to inspire us and stand tall as the last black man to see Bigo alive, as Azapo reminded us at the time. We trust that you will recover fully, as you did after many months of solitary confinement when you and Steve were arrested at the Makanda roadblock on the 18th of August in, 19, in 1977. The coronavirus pandemic has made us pause across the globe in an attempt to reassess and imagine a new world. But, but perhaps more profoundly, are the spontaneous local and global uprisings rejecting gender-based violence and harm and in the Me Too movement and systemic racism evinced in the Black Lives Matter movement. Peter Jones noted in 2014 that, I quote, Bigo, the Black Consciousness Movement, as well as Fanon, all believed in individual freedom and collective liberation grounded in the idea of social transformation towards radical society, I close quote. Yet, the Me Too and the Black Lives Matter mass mobilization are a clear demonstration that the ideal of a humanist society are nowhere near achieved. In the South African context, 26 years after the fracturing of the apartheid regime in 1994, we need to ask the fundamental questions of why are we still struggling to accept ourselves? and to be accepted by others. One would have hoped that after almost three decades, we would have been able to cast off the chains of mental and physical oppression as Bigo so eloquently exhorted us to do. In South Africa and globally, however, black lives remain cheap from the Marikana miners to the latest casualty in El Dorado Park just last week, of 16-year-old Nathaniel Julius to Trayvon Martin, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd in the United States, and I'm naming just only a few. And whilst we call out all these names, we need to recall the hundreds of women who have been raped, who have been brutalized and murdered, whose names are seldom acknowledged in the public domain and whom we often too easily forget after the event of their death. As we reflect on, teachers, on Bigo's teachings, there must be conscious work to build spaces that affirm Black women and are free from sexism, misogyny, and environments in which men in particular are centered. Collectively, our positioning should be unapologetic without needing to qualify blackness, because to love and desire freedom and justice for ourselves is a necessary prerequisite for wanting the same for others. Bigo taught us that, and I quote, freedom from whiteness would not be achieved unless black people exercise the power to construct who they were and produced their own knowledge, and I close quote. So as we convene today, program director, let us engage with the wisdoms that our speakers will share with us to carve out bold new imaginations steeped in the principles of Stephen Bantubigo, as has been uh, testi testified upon over the last decade during each memorial lecture at Nelson Mandela University. Let us recommit to strive collectively for that radically humanist society, a more just, inclusive, and humane world, socially and economically, as well as politically. In our quest to be a socially engaged university, 
I wish to acknowledge the quality of the interactive and engaging relationship between our own Kanrat and Azapo leadership, both locally and nationally. I thank this. Uh, I'm grateful for this. Our joint efforts have brought to bear the longest running Bigo Memorial Annual Public Lecture in South Africa. We trust that will, this will continue and it will continue to serve as a platform for all of us to converge once a year to remember Bigo, but also to ponder ways to strengthen the chains of solidarity towards a truly free society that we all deserve. I thank you uh, for this afternoon. I thank our speakers and I look forward to a wonderful lecture uh, this afternoon. Thank you so much, Professor Mandaza, uh, for coming to grace us in this manner. Thank you very much, colleagues. Thank you so much, Professor Swongile Mutwa, for, make, for, for making us feel at home. We are now again reminded about the significance of this day. And indeed, 43 years ago, a very special son of the soul was not only killed, but murdered in detention. But one thing that is important about Bantu Bigo's death is that he died fighting. He died on his feet. As such, this makes him a very, very important and indispensable symbol of black resistance. This is why we in the Black Conscious and Pan-Africanist movement maintain that Bigo did not die. Bigo indeed lives. So thank you so much for reminding us of the importance of today's gathering. Um, Ma Africa, ladies and gentlemen, sons and daughters of the soil, let me now introduce our second, um, in fact, the first speaker, Professor Ivo Mandaza, a comrade in the Azanian liberation struggle. Ibo Mandaza is a Zimbabwean academic, Zimbabwean only by colonial terms, but he's a son of the soil and a Pan-Africanist. He's an author, a publisher. He holds a, a doctorate of philosophy in political economy from the university, from the York University in England, obtained in 1979. He has taught in various universities in SADC, including Botswana, Zambia, Dar es Salaam, and of course, Zimbabwe. He has researched and researched and written extensively on issues of governance, international relations, and, pol and public policy, and was one of the first senior African civil servants in the post-independent Zimbabwe between 1980 and 1990. Having been a member of the Zimbabwe National Liberation Front in the Department of Research and Education and Manpower in the ZANU-PF um, headquarters in Maputo, Mozambique. He has served also as a director of the National Manpower Survey and permanent secretary in the Ministry of Manpower Planning and Development. He was also a deputy chairman of the Public Service Commission and the member of the Defense Forces Commission. And finally, as a chairperson of the Parastatals Commission, this is before his early retirement from civil service in July 1990 at a very young age of 42. Comrade Ibo Mandaza was a chairman of the board of directors of the second largest tourism and hotel group known as Rainbow Tourism Group in Zimbabwe from 1992 to 2009. Professor Ibo Mandaza is currently the executive chairperson of the Southern African Political Economy Series Trust, a regional think tank and a convener of policy and dialogue forum. Without wasting any time, I would like to officially welcome um, this son of the soil, Comrade Ibo Mandaza. We are always honored as Azanians, especially young people, to learn from you. You now have the floor. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much for that introduction. I was just wondering who you're speaking about. Thank you very much. Um, the Vice Chancellor, Professor Mutwa, the chair of the Nelson Mandela University Council, senior management of the university, the Azapo leadership in particular, my old comrades Strike, Tukwani, the Turile Cindy, 
Simpiwe Ashe, and of course, Mozibudi Mangena. University staff and students, scholars from the schools in the metro region, community members, indeed all South Africans, fellow African brothers and sisters at home and, and in the diaspora, comrades in this struggle. I want to thank sincerely the comrades of the womb. I have shared this historical space since the Boers refused my entry into South Africa in 1972. When a student president of the University of, of, of Rhodesia then, I was invited by Steve Biko, Harry Nguekulu, Bani Pichiana, and other stalwarts of the South African Students' Organization, which became the Black Consciousness Movement, BCM, to attend the historic conference in Turf Loop, on the base, base of which we converged in exile in Botswana in early 1977, after Abraham Tiro had been brutally assassinated by the Boers in Khabarone in 1976. And in, in anticipation of Steve Biko, who should have joined us in September 1977, but for his assassination on this day 43 years ago. The subsequent convergence in post independence Zimbabwe when we used our good offices in the new government to grant political asylum to the BCM Azapo comrades like Mosibidi Mangena, following the fallout with the Botswana authorities. Then the invitation extended to me, uh, extended to me by the comrades of the Black Rose Association, in particular Mojanki Gumbi in 1989. Then the Biko Memorial Lecture I presented in Joburg on the 11th of September 2004, entitled Remembering Steve Biko in the Context of Ten Years of Democracy. The honor and privilege to have presented the 18th Steve Biko Memorial Lecture at UNISA on 9th November 2017, entitled Pan Africanism, Class and the State in Southern Africa. And today, the rare and historic honor of presenting the 10th Steve Biko Annual Lecture at Nelson Mandela University. 43 years to the day of his murder on 12th September 1977. Indeed, sincere gratitude to the Nelson Mandela University and likewise to my comrades of the BCM and Zappa legacy, without whom I could not have been afforded all these opportunities of honoring our brother and comrade, Steve Biko. These are indeed the ties that forever bind us for the decades of the struggle so far. In this regard, it is also an occasion to thank the Biko family, in particular, Steve's son, Ngosinati, who hosted me in Grahamstown and Ginsburg three years ago after the 18th Steve Biko Memorial Lecture at UNISA, and during which I visited the Steve Biko Shrine, the impressive Biko Memorial Center in Ginsburg, the family home, and in general, the historic surroundings in Ginsburg that hopefully we can all help to enhance appropriately as a monument to this great human being, Steve Biko. Therefore, my lecture today, I've uh, been asked to speak on breaking the barriers of neocolonialism to restore true humanity and dignity. I can only try. I entitled this Not Yet Uhuru, a reiteration of the theme. Therefore, this day is a poignant reminder that blacks, black lives matter to refer to the movement that has been so sparked into life by the murder of George Floyd on 21st, 25th of May, 2020. In circumstances similar to those under which Steve was killed 43 years ago today. And today we've been reading accounts, we've been, our memories have been refreshed in the, uh, in the manner in which Steve was tortured, his head beat against the wall, 
and then driven over a thousand kilometers from from uh, Elizabeth to to Joburg. And so hereby, to, re to reiterate the historical, political, ideological, and socioeconomic factors that underpin and pervade our rea reality as Africans at home and in the diaspora. As I highlighted in my previous BICO lectures, the first, the national question. The national question, question in Africa has to be understood in terms of the historical, political, and economic factors that also defined the process whereby Africa and Africans were relegated in the international division of labor. The European expansion that began in the 15th century, specifically in 1492, when Columbus, quote, discovered, quote, the new world, and says my late brother Samir Amin, simultaneously began the nightmare for the rest of the world, which thereby became the third world. And so Africa, likewise, a quote, discovered and underdeveloped as a geopolitical concept within the global parameters of a voracious Caucasian onslaught, the transatlantic slave trade through which Africans were dehumanized, pillaged, and transported as mere commodities across the oceans. The colonial era during which mother continent was broken,ized parceled out among the European powers, and whole people dispossessed of their political sovereignty, economic rights, and sheer capacity. The current neo-colonial period during which, notwithstanding the gains made with the attainment of political independence, and the establishment of the nation state in making, still find Africa and Africans at the bottom of the heap of human existence and development. Therefore, the post independence and all post apartheid track record has to be assessed in relation to the state's capacity to resolve the national question. On the extent to which Africans worldwide can claim that they have moved closer to the restoration of both their dignity as a people and Africa's rightful place in global affairs. For, as Amika Cabral stated, for Africans and those of African descent the world over, the resolution of the national question must necessarily include the successful struggle towards the rectification of history, Africa's history, our history, and their code. It is history which the colonialists have taken from us. The colonialists usually say that it was they who brought us into history. Today, we show that this is not so. They made us live history, our history, to follow them right at the back, to follow the progress of their history. Today, in taking up arms to liberate ourselves, we want to return to our history on our own feet, by our own means, and through our own sacrifices." End of quote. Secondly, the post liberation and the specter of neocolonialism. As I point out in the 18th Steve Biko Memorial Lecture on 9th November 2017, the foundations of the national question in Southern Africa are implicit in the following mission statement by one Cecil John Rhodes on the eve of the Berlin Congress of 1884, which divided Africa among the European colonialists and unleashed a combination of historical, economic, and political forces which have since then carved and shaped the subregion. And I quote from Rhodes. I was in the east end of London, a working class quarter yesterday, and attended a meeting of the unemployed. I listened to the wild speeches, which were just a cry for bread, bread, bread. And on my way home, I pondered over the scene, and I became more than ever convinced of the importance of imperialism. My cherished idea is a solution of the social problem. That is, in order to save 
40,000 inhabitants of the United Kingdom from a bloody civil war, we colonial statesmen must acquire new lands to settle the surplus population, to provide new markets for the goods produced in the factories and mines. The empire, as I've always said, is a bread and butter question. If you want to avoid civil war, you must become imperialist, end of quote. In short, it was on the back of Rhodes' dream of a British Empire from Cape to Cairo that South Africa became the launching pad for the colonization of the neighboring countries, some of whom arrogantly, arrogantly carried his name Rhodesia. So, almost two decades into post liberation, is it, is it incorrect to describe Southern Africa and post apartheid South Africa itself? as a special form of neocolonialism, as having been a peculiar case of colonialism or white settler colonialism, reflecting the imperialist objectives of creating white dominions like Canada, Australia and New Zealand, out of South Africa and Zimbabwe. Thirdly, the pitfalls of national consciousness. The neo-colonial order is a combination of both the imperatives of the colonial mission and the class structure it inheres in the process, reflected in the incapacity, the lack of capacity of the class, the petty bourgeoisie, that inherits power from the colonizers to lead a successful transform transformative revolution. As, as it has turned out, the liberation struggle in Southern Africa was less about a socialist revolution than an African nationalist quest to resolve its own concept of the national question through the attainment, attainment of political independence or the national democratic revolution, as some of you call it here in South Africa, as a foundation of the nation state in the making and the attended tasks of resolving such questions as the land question improved standard of living for the working people, the modernization of the education and health systems, resolution of the gender question, and in general, the restoration of the dignity of the African person after centuries of white domination. But as is the case in the rest of post-colonial Africa, this is work in progress in post-liberation Southern Africa characterized by glaring shortfalls across the board. So even a cursory audit of the recent post-liberation period reveals one characterized by continuities as opposed to transformation in the economic and social realms. And the consequent rise of a comparable class of leaders in both state and private sectors with the hegemonic oversight of international capital. As that great man O.R. Tambo warned us all in 1990 on his return to South Africa, and I quote, the struggle is far from over. If anything, it has become more complex and therefore more difficult, end of quote. Indeed, given the backdrop of post liberation Southern Africa so far, there is an inescapable conclusion that the African nationalist era, inclusive of the national liberation movements, have long served their purpose as the agency for the attainment of political independence and all the formal end of apartheid, and no more. As a class project, it is both historically preempted and ideologically constrained from taking us further than we've come so far. More than that, more than that it has is, it is turned out to be naive, if not self-indulgent and downright presumptuous, to have expected that this class of leaders that inherited state power could have served as an anticipated vanguard, the substitute for the national bourgeoisie, through which to drive the national development agenda and then enhance the fortunes of the nation state in the making. It is an understatement to conclude 
that the post liberation phase so far has been a resounding failure, especially in the economic transformation front. Therefore, as in the rest of post independence Africa, Kwame Nkrumah's dictum that seek ye first the political kingdom and all other things will be added unto you, now rings hollow in the face of the pitfalls of national conscious, consciousness that Franz Fernand warned about already in the late 60s. So even the political kingdoms they themselves have lost their gloss, increasingly tarnished by a breed of clueless leaders, mavericks and megalomaniacs. And so the mass of, of our people, the wretched of the earth, as Franz Fernand described them, even as a hope and expectation for freedom were contagious in the 1960s and 1970s, remain largely disenchanted and almost helpless in the face of states characterized by less by the commitment to democratic governance and progressive economic and social development than by crude and backward forms of mass regimentation as opposed to genuine mobilization mainly in the interest of the indefinite incumbency and veneration of the big leader. Yes, my brother William Mutunga, former Chief Justice of Kenya, has said, and I quote, in describing the big leader syndrome in Africa, I quote, his face is on money, his photograph hangs in every part of Israel. His ministers wear gold pins with tiny photographs of him on the labels of the Prince Jack tailored suits. He names streets, football stadiums, hospitals and universities after himself. He carries a silver inlaid ivory rungu or an ornately carved walking stick or a fly whisk or a chiefly stool. He insists on being called doctor or being the big elephant or the number one peasant or nice old man or national miracle, or the most popular leader in the world. Every pronouncement is reported in the, on the first page. He shuffles ministers without warning, paralyzes policy decisions as he undercuts pretenders to his throne. He scapegoats minorities to show up popular support. He bans all political parties except the one he controls. He rigs elections. He emascul emasculates the courts and he cows the press. He stifles academia. He gives the church. The big man's off the cuff remarks have the power of law. He demands thunderous applause from the legislature when ordering far reaching changes in the constitution. He blesses the home region of the highways, schools, hospitals, housing projects, irrigation schemes, and a presidential mansion. He packs the civil service with his service with his tribesmen. His enemies are harassed by youth, youth wingers from the ruling party. His enemies are detained or exiled, humiliated and tortured or killed. End of quote. So, what is to be done? There could be no better occasion than today, still a bigger day, to remind ourselves of the inherent values of black consciousness as both self-awareness of who we are as a people and our inherent capacity to liberate ourselves under the banner of renewed Pan-Africanism. Therefore, firstly, the need for reassertion of black consciousness, consciousness as part of the global Pan-African movement on the back of the current slogan, Black Lives Matter. This should begin with the curriculum in our own tertiary institutions, particularly universities such as yours. In the study of the political economy of Africa, as is to be the subject of the Kwame Nkrumah Academy in the proposed Pan-Africa, the postgraduate post -graduate university for policy studies in Africa, which the Supplis Trust is soon to establish. This should begin with the defining Africa the geopolitical and historical context, European expansionism from 1492 
the transatlantic slave trade, imperialism, and colonialism. The African diaspora, the Pan-African movement, the anti-colonial struggle and liberation struggles, and including African political philosophies, ideologies, and development paradigms, including black consciousness itself, Pan-Africanism, nationalism, and the decolonization school of thought. As used to be the practice at the University of Dar es Salaam, where I taught in his eight days of such Pan-African scholars as Walter Rodney and his How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, Claude Ake, Nishere Mugo, Okudiba Noli, Dani Nabuderi, Archie Mafeje, Issa Shilji, Yash Tenden, and some of us, including myself. These subjects, under the rubric of development studies, were compulsory across the board, from humanities and social studies to engineering, medicine, and, and, natural, and natural sciences, and a prerequisite for the award of any degree in the university. Africa itself has to produce a leadership that understands the reality that it seeks to transform. But it is also against the background of an educated and informed population that Africa can rid itself of the new class of the compound of bourgeoisie and address the absence of a viable class of people who can drive the economic development. The comparative bourgeoisie, which we call the residue of international finance capital, a class which now straddles both the public and, and the so-called private sectors, and has increasingly captured the state in our countries in partnership with international capital and all its cartels. Elsewhere, particularly in the 18th Steve Biko Memorial Lecture at UNISA, the Pan-Africanism class as the state in, Af in Southern Africa, I outlined in some detail the historical origins of the conflict of bourgeoisie in Southern Africa in particular, and Africa generally, including the role of such multinationals, for example, Anglo-America, Londo, and so on, as they have been associated with extractive industries, and how they compradorized some of the key African nationalists even before Freedom Day itself. But perhaps, not surprisingly, Surprisingly, it has been largely through the extractive industries that the comprador of bourgeoisie has grown during this post-liberation period, expressing itself as it has, not only through the members of the political and military, security and bureaucratic hierarchy, and in collaboration with their counterparts in the private sector, and in multinationals at home and abroad, but also in the apparent conflation between power, corruption and wealth. But the main import of my submission today is to underscore why this class cannot and will never serve as the engine of development in Africa. For by nature, the comrade of bourgeois is a class in itself and for itself. It is bereft of a national vision, no national interest, mainly because it is incapable of conceiving such. And more significantly, it is a class that lives for today uncertain about tomorrow, and hence the looting of the coffers becomes a frenzy. These are nothing less than thieves, says my late brother, brother Gupta Mdenda. Therefore, secondly, we need a state based on constitutional and developmental democracy. Only through a pan-Africanist and technocratic leadership can the reform of the state in Africa begin in earnest. From the one so given to predatory, parasitic, and primitive accumulation, all of which have produced the comrade of bourgeoisie, to one committed to the struggle of constitutional and developmental democracy within the context of the separation of powers between an executive, which is supposed to be accountable, the legislature, which is supposed to be both well informed and vibrant, as a representative of the, of the people, and the judiciary which is supposed to be fiercely independent, being the soul of the nation. Secondly, with national institutions established in the terms, in terms of the constitution of the country 
and therefore staffed by persons of integrity, non-partisan and patriotic. And a concerted attack on corruption, beginning with a lifestyle audit of leaders in both public and private sectors, including a public disclosure of assets on the part of office holders. Thirdly, the imperative uh, of the economic transformation. In the absence of a viable class such as the national bourgeoisie in the developed economies of the first world, which could be the engine of economic development and transformation, Africa needs to go back to the drawing board. And like its founding fathers in the 60s and 70s, through such things as the Lagos Plan of Action, for example, return to the public enter enterprise model, especially with respect to the extractive industries, which both historically and currently have been the main agencies through which colonialism by excellence reached our shores, produced such classes in our midst, and gave rise to new colonialism from the East, competing with the one from the West, but with similar and devastating consequences for Africa. Particularly, China is one that is in the forefront of the ravage of Africa's natural and mineral resources. And yet its economy has grown on the back of public enterprises at home. Between 1949 and 1969, China successfully reorganized its economy away from dependence on the West and from a semi-colony to an independent and self-reliant one. And although the private sector was reintroduced in the mid-1970s, state economic activities will still control the country's economy. With this control, China has now moved from a very backward semi-colony in 1949 the second most powerful economy in the world. It is presently seriously challenging for the number one economic power position. The 2019 Forbes Fortune 500 global list of the world's best for performing banks is the best four from China. Firstly, the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China. Second, the China Construction Bank Corporation. Third, the Agriculture Bank of China, and fourth, the Bank of China. All these four banks are fully state-owned banks in China. There needs to be restoration, reform, and rationalization of public enterprises. It is viable economic units, well staffed by qualified and efficient personnel, and adhering to the corporate governance criteria applicable today to all organizations. In addition, the public economic entities should focus on those sectors most in need of beneficiation, e.g. mining and agriculture, and therefore given to manufacturing, industrial and technological development, and of course, employment creation. They must compete with those in the private sector, and if necessary, partner these, including such multinationals as those from which to gain expertise and access to markets. There should, be the, there should be the restoration of the National Development Plan to ensure equal and, and even development across the country, including rural development, human development, and social security, and attention to the vulnerable groups in, in our society. We should develop regional public enterprises to be established along and take into account existing trade linkages in such key sectors as energy, transport, infrastructure and effecting and, and putting into effect those provisions already existing at both regional and continental levels. Last but not least, we must give attention to the African economic community. The provisions of the African economic community are clearly spelled out in the Abuja Treaty. What's required now is the requisite leadership and political resolve with which to concretize the African economic community. Then, of course, Pan-Africanism and the integration of Africa. Therefore, as a title of the book, edited by myself and Daniel Abudiari in 2002, genuine Pan-Africanism can grow in the context of the political and economic reform of the neo-colonial state, whose cultural 
and economic structures have from birth been linked in, in, in the imitation and subservience to the interests of the former colonial and other metropolitan powers. Therefore, to base regional integration on these states amounts to no more than an assumption that there is a historical viability for the new colonial state as a departure point for African development, the renaissance or advancement. This cannot be. In conclusion, therefore, the future of Pan-Africanism is also the pursuit of supranationalism, by which I meant the following, quoting my own in the Four Mission book. Because this is because supranationalism and pan-Africanism here require the need to transcend the arena of national interest. But the latter will, in effect, only be enhanced through some sacrifice of the principles of sovereignty in the pursuit of regional economic reciprocity. In this regard, supranational is akin to deep integration. It is a pooling of sovereignty on a wide range of policy issues, which can be the basis of a political union, such as the Federation of Southern Africa, as a building block towards the realization of the goals and the objectives of the African Union and on the base of which Africa can take its place as an equal partner in the global community." End of quote. As Malcolm X warned in 1960, I quote, no matter where the black person is, you will never be respected until Africa is a world power. End of quote. A solemn reminder that Steve Biko and black consciousness remains relevant in 2020, 43 years after his brutal murder and the year during which the Black Lives Matter movement is so much in resonance with the centuries-old struggle for the restoration of the dignity of the African person. I thank you. Thank you for those words. Thank you so much, Professor Mandaza, for reminding us that we are indeed not yet Uhuru. I think for the context of Azania or occupied Azania, we couldn't resonate more with that statement because 27 years later, institutional racism is still a big problem in our democracy. So thank you for those words. And indeed, thank you for reminding us again um, about our failures and limitations in the journey of independence, especially when you refer to what you call the big leader syndrome. I think it is the epitome of colonial mentality, something that Steve Biko's Black Consciousness advocated for. It is a, a our leaders, especially in Africa, they adopted a colonial framework of liberation. So this is why they could not see the world from what Biko would call black consciousness. So thank you for reminding us that because this same big leader syndrome translates into reality through ways of erasing black women because we do not see black women um, because they are hidden by this big leader syndrome that is predominantly led by our uh, male leaders, especially across the African continent. It shapes the political imaginary, you know, so that women become minors and marginalized. So thank you for bringing us forth and we hope um, those who are listening can, you know, take, take a leaf from your presentation. In this juncture, I would like to take um, the audience attention to what is happening outside of what you see. Of course, we are live on Facebook. We are also live on Kandra's um, Facebook page. We will take your questions and answers from that page. Please feel free to engage us. Uh, we are looking forward to hear from you because this is not a dialogue. It's a conversation on one of the most important um, human beings to ever walk the soil of Azania. Without wasting time, allow me, ladies and gentlemen, comrades and fellow Azanians, to welcome Simpua Sisanti, who is um, not a stranger in this Pan-Africanist <coughs> consciousness family. Um, he will be, of course, the respondent to Professor Ibo Mandazi. Just to give you a bit of 
background about Professor Susanti. He's currently the, a professor at the University of the Western Cape in the Faculty of Education. Um, he's also the editor of an international um, journal of African Renaissance Studies, IAS. He, is a, he holds a Doctor of Philosophy in Journalism Studies which he obtained from the University of Stellenbosch, where he also taught seven years in the Department of Journalism. He has also taught in the Department of Journalism, Media and Philosophy at the Nelson Mandela University. This is before he joined the University of the Western Cape. Professor Sisanti also worked um, at the University of South Africa at the Institute for African Renaissance Studies. He has published in accredited journals on a variety of issues, including gender, education, African philosophy, journalism, politics, and spirituality. He's an author of two books, a co-editor of one book, and a contributor of chapters in a number of books. He is a 2018 um, NRF rated researcher. Without wasting it, Tasha, we'd like to welcome the son of the soil. The platform is yours. Thank you. Comrade uh, Program Director, revolutionary greetings. Uh, Comrade Professor Ibo Mandaza, allow me to say Pambirine Chimurenga, Pambirine Kubatana, Pambirine Ondo. Um, Madam Vice Chancellor, please allow me to say Sunny Bonan and uh, to thank Conrad and the entire university for having invited me back home. Uh, before I proceed, uh, Program Director, allow me to greet the woman whose womb was the first home of Bantubik. And uh, she belongs to the clan of Onyanyeza, Opuhoma, Abacheto, Tiza, Mongo, Omlanjana. Ombambos no mongo malasalututu wanya telu yacha. And of course, his father was um Okil. I went obo 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 chopo. Ngabo apa matrina. Eono kuinza. Ngabo abo sebabuli sanabo. It's very important to acknowledge the presence of the spiritual world. Um, because Bantu Biko beyond the grave is also beating the drum for us and blowing the horn. And so we greet him in the presence of the ancestor spirits. Um, Comrade Ibo Mandaza, thank you very much um, for your beautiful presentation. Um, as you were outlining your paper, I could not help but think uh, of Walter Rodney. And uh, Walter Rodney passed on um, in 1980, and this year we were, we were observing the anniversary um, of that great son of the soil, 40th anniversary. And so, uh, those who were present said that, but there's a world awaiting us. Indeed, there are many worlds awaiting us. And one of those is the world of our children who are not yet born. And he said that um, that world cannot be realized, and we're paraphrasing these uh, comrades, unless the center is transformed. But the center itself cannot be transformed unless we ourselves are transformed. And so you earlier on, you spoke about Franz Fanon and Franz Fanon told us that uh, the declaration of negation is not in itself negation. And so we link um, uh, Walter Rodney and we link Franz Fanon. And again, we, we, we recall that uh, before he moved on, Franz Fanon had told us that uh, there is no greatness in procrastination and that there is no dishonor in stating what and who we are. The, the reason, pro, 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 Professor Mendoza, that we are in the mess that we are in today is that throughout the, the liberation struggle, we had always been looking over our shoulder, concerned about those that would threaten our existence, would say, and so we wanted to be accommodated by them. And Walter Rodney rejected this, and Fanon rejected this, because they distinguished between the reform and the revolution. And that is what Bantubiko brought for us. When Bantubiko came to the fore in 1968, he was a young man of 22. And he began to tell the people of Azania that uh, we were not non-whites. Instead, we were black people because Bantubiko in the revolutionary movement was rejecting us being measured 
on the standards by others. Our existence was not in relation to others. Our existence was an independent existence. And unless we were able to get that, we would not be able to articulate. And that links with what Fanon was telling us, that um, you know, they, 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 we, we, there is no dishonor in stating what and who we are. Because when we do not clearly state what and who we are, those that are supposed to be traveling to, together with us become confused in this um, in this journey. And so thank you very much. In a way, you, you have reminded us of those um, important points. I also need to, to point out, and I was listening to, to the Vice Chancellor, to the Program Director, and you, Professor Mandaza, um, you know, about um, what Bantu Biko did um, as he was liberating us and the Black Consciousness Movement, um, you know, um, and mentally. Uh, there's something that is not known by many of us, that uh, the, the, when the Black People's Convention came onto the fore in 1972, the first president of the Black People's Convention was a woman. And that woman is Ma Winihuare. So the Black Consciousness Movement at the time liberated us already from patriarchy. It is something that uh, many of us um, need uh, to, to revisit. And so having said that, we need to link it again with what is taking place this year. This year, we are marking the 120th anniversary of the Pan-African Conference um, that was initiated by William Blyden. Two significant issues about that. One of them is that the organization, the African Association, that initiated the Pan-African Conference in, 19, in 1900 was initiated by a woman, an African, Alice Kinlock. That is very important. And that there were great revolutionary women, uh, Anna Alice, um, um, Anna J. Jones, and Anna Julian Cooper, who were leading this revolutionary movement. So that as we remember Bantu Biko, we need to recall these important facts about the history of the Pan-Africanist movement and the Black Consciousness movement. And having said this then, um, Comrade uh, Ibo, I was listening to you as you were pointing the way forward. And uh, you know, you, you made reference to uh, Bantu Biko spoke about the, the Black Consciousness and the quest for a true humanity. It is important that uh, we should note that Bantu Biko, in leading us in this direction together with the Black Consciousness Movement, um, he did not look very far. Many of our leaders, you know, decolonization of the mind um, means one fundamental important point that uh, you move away and begin to liberate yourself from dependency on your for on 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 your oppressors. And so, um, you know, in that sense, Bantu Biko said um, that uh, the Western world may have done wonders in giving the world a military and industrial outlook. But the greatest gift is yet to come from Africa, giving the world a humane face. And Bantu Biko at the time um, was not confused about what needed to be done. He was very clear, this being that, you know, and he pointed us to the African cultural concepts. And that this is the title of one of his papers in A Right What I Like. So it is important that as we liberate ourselves uh, mentally, you know, for, for a very long time, we have looked east, we have looked west, we have spoken Marxism, we have spoken that. And yet the truth of the matter is, as Mwalimu Julius Nyerere tells us, long before uh, Karl Marx and everyone else began to conceptualize socialism, in this continent, our ancestors, you know, had said that the land cannot belong to an individual. The land is the common property of the ancestors that must be shared by everyone. And so therefore, from African cultural traditions, private ownership of the land has always been frowned upon. And so that then on this occasion, we need to recall that Bantu Biko understood this. For if, if then, if, if you are serious that uh, in our struggle, we want to take the masses together with us and not make them bystanders who are cheering from the margins. We've got to speak in the language that our, our, our people understand. And if we are to speak in that, the language is not merely a linguistic issue, it's a cultural issue. And so we must give to, it is for this reason that Julius Nyerere Mwalimu spoke about Ujama. Um, in the in the context of that, but the truth of the matter, though, is that you know the 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 order that we want, the humane order that we want, cannot come to the fore 
unless we bring about and create a cadre that in itself is humane. And this was the understanding of Bantubiko in the Black Consciousness Movement um, when he led this and led the, you know, cultural programs. And you're quite correct, um, uh, Comrade Mandaz, in, in saying, in making the point, you know, um, that a, a, a change and a real change must come. And Bantubiko, for this reason, distinguished for us the difference between integration and assimilation. And so that uh, integration is coming together of forces on an equal basis, but assimilation is um, being swallowed up by others. And Comrade Mandaza, you're quite correct in pointing us to the history because when we do not have a sense of a historical background, we are going not to have a clear sense of where we are going. And we know in terms of neocolonialism that it was not by chance, it was a deliberate exercise. Um, when the Europeans never meant to allow us to be free. And this was captured well by Petrus Lumumba before they they butchered him. And they said that, uh, you know, they, they had never been sincere about it. They had never been. And that's why in Nigeria, um, when the, on the eve of the so-called independence, they pushed in their intelligence systems so that they could decide who was going to be the leader. And Franz Fanon again captures this in, um, in, um, in his book by saying that, you know, on the eve, always, the enemy identifies amongst the liberation forces, those that they are comfortable with and, de de and determines that they are going to be the ones they are going to negotiate with and also determine and advance the economic system. And we know from the National Intelligence Service uh, writers, they've told us that uh, when they were negotiating them, um, you know, with, with the African National Congress, um, they were willing to allow um, African people to vote and do anything and everything. But for as long as the economic power was going to be in their hands, nothing else mattered. In Zimbabwe, um, in 1979, they made sure that as the Zimbabwean people were advancing towards a certain victory, they called in our leaders and told them that uh, they would, they must not, they must defer. What mattered most was the Zimbabwean people were not voting, were not fighting to vote until they turned purple. They were fighting for the land that had been dispossessed from them. And they said at Lancaster for the next 10 years, please, you will not have your, your freedom. And they turned around again and said, yeah, but your people have not delivered. And yet they knew that they had tied our hands and our feet in the process. And again, they ridiculed us. And 1990, they told Mugabe that Mugabe must uh, tone down through the NC and told Mugabe must tone down uh, about the land question so that the white people in South Africa would not be threatened at all times. The concern being about the, our oppressors and little concern about those um, that are oppressed. And so at this point, I, I, I decided the program director, you know, I, I, I prepare a particular time and I don't go beyond. So three minutes left for me. And um, in that uh, three minutes that is remaining because the it's comrade uh, Mandaza today was uh, delivering this lecture. Mine is just uh, to respond. I've heard quite often comrade Mandaza uh, that, uh, you know, when Kruma is, um, is cited, they said, uh, he said that uh, take political independence and all the rest is going to follow. But we need to to state that Kwame Nkrumah was very clear that uh, political independence in itself was not complete um, and that uh, economic independence was also not going to be um, automatic. And, um, you know, he articulated this very clearly in, in his 1963 book, I think Africa must unite and made this point very clearly that nothing is going to come automatically, that nothing is going to come easily, uh, that uh, the phase in which we are in now was an inevitable phase, um, but the struggle continues. Ours, um, as the poet began earlier, is not simply to cite, I write what I like. Ours is to live, I write what I like. Ours is to form, follow in the wisdom of the philosopher Mushomi, who told us, um, that uh, those who are sincere about the revolution must always be found in the midst of the oppressed. And allow me, um, Comrade uh, Ivo, uh, to conclude with what you said earlier and cite um, Cabral when he told us that uh, tell no lies, claim no easy victories. Kamela, Nokwinda, Chopo, Kwanga, Apo, Kona, Ungasbetela Makubu. Uze matongwe ni kuti, ukwenzele basibu wa nindele. 
wena watwala lomfana mama wetu wakulisisizwe nani nonke bo mama bethu abakole mimoya sicela nisiphambandla nesikhanyisele nesiqhwabele izandla nesiqhensela khona ukwenza lento kuba sizokufikelela apha kufanele sikho noma sithene cana kho thank you thank you so so much putsi santi um for those words your presentation always speaks to the heart and you remind us that we are never alone like bigo died so that we can continue to revive him spiritually therefore the significance of centering spirituality in our resistance cannot be undermined thank you again for reminding us that the first our first home is a mother our first home is a woman and of course we forget this because we are still operating under the guise of the big leader syndrome to quote um, professor mandaza indeed Bigo had enjoyed tremendous support from her mother alice um nokuzola Bigo. we of course reminded that the black consciousness was indeed the first organization to allow a woman to lead them when we commemorate um women's day no one talks about the other winnie no one talks about mama winnie Hware. so though i'd like to i'd like to really thank you for bringing us you know into that um understanding especially now because we tend to forget about the role of women we tend to forget that the mother is the first home for everyone and i'd like to also appreciate how you bring us back to today's um topic the topic that forces us to wrestle with what Biko said, the quest for true humanity. What is this quest for true humanity is perhaps the question that most of us need to understand and answer and wrestle with today. Of course, Biko was very clear that he was not speaking to some amorphous um, common humanity. It was a very specific form of community um, that he was advocating for. A humanity perhaps that is not born out of violence, um, a humanity that will give black people um, to be the standard of humanity because the, the current standard of humanity as we know it is a standard of the colonizer, a standard of humanity that is um, unethical in how it treats other human beings, a standard of humanity which I dare say is a very low standard of humanity. Therefore, in Biko's quest for a true humanity, we are reminded again to go back you know, as black people and find that source of humanity, which I believe is already embedded in us as Abandabam Nyam. So thank you again for reminding us that Biko had, you know, new hopes for us. He wanted to make black people to be the standard of thought, the standard of, um, of being, you know, this is Biko's quest. I would like now to invite my colleague Sonabo to take us through the Q and A's. I believe people have sent us their comments, their reflections, and it will be very nice to hear what um, the whole of Azania, indeed the whole of um, the world is thinking in this very moment. Sonabo, I'm handing over to you. All right, thank you so much, Zandi. I don't know if I'm live. Am I audible and visible? All right, thank you so much. Thanks to our guest speaker and to Prof. Sasanti, really. Um, judging from our chat room and our social platforms, the, the engagement is really heated. I've got a couple of questions here for Prof. Ibu and for Prof. Sasanti. So for this round, Zandi, I have at least four and I think you will afford us an opportunity again to come back. All right, the first comment, which also follows by a question, comes from Ubongani, who is in Kwazakele Township in Port Elizabeth. He says, Steve Mandubiko was a popular voice of black liberation in South Africa between the mid 1960s and his death in police detention in 1977. This was the period in which both the ANC and the PAC had been officially banned and the disenfranchised black population, especially young people, were highly receptive to the prospects of a new organization that could carry their grievances against the apartheid status. So the question is, in the current crisis in South Africa relating to education, corruption and other social ills, 
Are we acknowledging the role played by other political parties other than the ANC? That is the first question. I don't know if profs have captured that. And then number two, from Undombo Vuyo Somgada in Udenhaik, our hometown. Current Black Lives Matter protests are putting unprecedented pressure on the racial injustices which black people face in all walks of life in this country and elsewhere. People are marching defiantly through major cities across the globe to demand that the legacies of colonialism and systematic racism be dismantled. Therefore, the question is, what are the lessons to be learned from both Steve Biko and George Floyd death, especially for young people? That is the second question. Then, Yasmin Yokebela from Unokolo Ndungane. The life and death of Steve Biko in the hands of the white settler regime signifies the intentions on by him and the black consciousness, particularly African life, from the onslaught of capitalism, imperialism, and white racism. Therefore, the question is, what is Biko's contribution in the African continent? That is the third question. Biko's contribution in the African continent. And then the last one, Zandi and the professors, comes from Usanele Bua. Usanele say, thank you, Professor Santi, for, re for reviving the spirit of Biko to be amongst ourselves today, which I think in a political arena in South Africa is highly missing. So the question is, so how do we instill spirit and humanity into our leaders, particularly those who are in power? Back to you, Zandi. Thank you for offering me the opportunity. Thank you so much, Sonabo, for giving us those questions. Um, I don't know. I want to use my own discretion in terms of how the questions should go. Um, Professor Sisanti, I'd like you to deal with the first question on the role of other political organization because I think it locates the conversation in Azania. And you have, of course, advantage of that context. And I'd also like you to um, deal with the second question on lessons on Bigo and the Black Lives Matter, George Floyd's murder in the United Snakes of America. Um, Professor Mandaza, you will then take the other two, Bigo's contribution in the African continent, because you are a, a Pan-Africanist. And, and the final question, I hope that is in order, comrades, Professor Sisanti and Professor Mandaza, thank you. So, Professor Sisati, you will go first, my brother. Thank you very much, Program Director. Very quickly, um, you know what has taken place um, in the in the in the liberation struggle. Um, there have been some sectionalism across. Um, you know, each movement thinking that it was better than the other, and this is what Bantubiko, you know, Totas Bantubiko, when he, when he emerged was aware of both the existence of the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania and the ANC of South Africa. But when he passed on and was captured, he was on his way of uniting all these movements in spite of the differences, political differences that existed. So the most important lesson that is yet to be learned by many of us, especially the young people, is that um, each and every, you know, um, ideological um, stance must be appreciated uh, debated and engaged. We have differences within political organizations and there are differences between political organizations. So it calls for the majority that Bantubiko had um, to, to acknowledge, and that is what we call consensus. We, we acknowledge the differences what we had, but we emphasize more um, on what holds us together. And so the point then that uh, we need to do is that uh, Bantubiko, you know, did not wait. There was a lot of resistance um, from some people, both within the ANC and the PAC, um, of uh, acknowledging and recognizing uh, the Black Consciousness Movement because they thought that these cadres were juniors. But uh, Bantu Biko did not seek the approval. Um, the Black Consciousness forged ahead and did what it needed to be to, to be done. And in fact, um, the the both the cadres in the Black on, in the in the ANC and the PAC acknowledge that um, both organizations were at their weakest when the Black Consciousness Movement came to the fore and it injected life. So 
maturity dictates that we must appreciate one another and seek one another out as those who are disadvantaged so that we need to do what we need to be done. The second question quickly, uh, Comrade uh, Program Director, what the, the most important lesson that has perhaps not been focused upon by us is that George Floyd was killed on May 25 on the day that uh, we are supposed to be celebrating Africa Day. And it shows the contempt, you know, um, and perhaps disregard. I, I doubt that uh, those who killed him were even aware. Uh, because the truth of the matter is that those of us as African people who are supposed to be sensitive to this and celebrate this so as to raise the consciousness of ourselves amongst ourselves, we are not doing that. And it is for this reason, in the absence of the necessary consciousness and appreciation of our own achievements and failures and the need to reflect on this, the world will continue to treat us with contempt as they did with George Floyd. So the problem is not so much, you know, the, the problem is not so much the power of the oppressor. The problem is the weakness of the oppressed. And we've got to understand that. And that is where we are. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Sisanti. Um, Professor Mandaza, please have the floor, sir. Yes, I think uh, what is Biko's contribution to the African continent? I think the first thing to say is that the the Biko era, which is also my era, our generation, uh, the early 70s to mid 70s, represents in the history of the struggle a gener generational change. It, time when most of the movements were, were were banned at home, whether it was ANC, PAC, uh, ZAPU, ZANU, or banned. And our generation represents a generational change in the sense that we sought one to unite, as uh, the professor just said, to unite the liberation movements. We are acutely embarrassed at our, in our generation at the quibbling, the divisions within the liberation movement. So we brought about our generation um, a, a focus on the need for unity around such uh, movements as the Black Cultures Movement. We had, our, we had a Black Cultures Movement in Zimbabwe, and this is why I was invited to, to Turf Loop in 1972. And the idea of uh, reiterating the importance of awareness of ourselves as a people with the capacity to liberate ourselves was very important. And that, that contribution cannot be forgotten. And that is why we readily respond to Biko Day as we, do, as we did. And, 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 and the, 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 the added significance this year is I mean, the, the death of uh, uh, George Floyd on Africa Day, in circumstances very similar to those that Steve was killed. A reminder, a poignant reminder, that we're not free yet as African people, as black people, at home and in the diaspora. It's a shocking uh, revelation, but one that must spark us into life. We still have to, we have a lot, have a lot to do ahead of us. And I think that uh, whereas I was very impressed with what has been done uh, for the for the Biko uh, monument in, in the Greensburg, I just feel that the current leadership in South Africa and in Africa as well has to do much more to venerate the the, the, the importance of Steve Biko. Uh, and I'm hoping that the Black Lives Matter will help also to, to raise the poignancy of Steve, Bantu Steve Biko, as a as, 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 as an immortal symbol of the struggle of the African peoples over the centuries. I thank you. Um, Prof, I think you, you left out the final question in terms of how do we instill um, Biko's um, spirit, Biko's thought 
because ethic of leadership into the current um, leadership who are in power in not just Azani, of course, but throughout the African continent. Well, I think I, I think I dealt with this. Okay. okay. That I, I might have. By, by, I might by, have mistaken. By raising the profile uh, of Steve Biko, continentally, a man who died in struggle, uh, is a very important symbol that we should follow. And I'm saying that the not enough has been done in South Africa itself. And I just say in my concluding, in my introduction, that we outside South Africa, and we have had discussions with uh, the Biko family, we'd like to add to the monument, the Biko Center, as another monument of, of the pan African movement, of which Black Coaches is part. And we have we've been discussing that. And we, we, intend, we, we hope in the next year or two, the pan African uh, uh, university that we're setting up, will have, will have a, a Steve Biko school within it. It's part of the pan African movement. So we, 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 these are very important uh, lessons that we are going through. The, and I'm, I'm, I'm so happy that today there are at least three, four big lectures taking place, uh, including one at Tunisia by, by Reverend Shapson an hour from now. You know, so I think the Biko, the Biko factor has become an important feature of our of our, our calendar on the African continent. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, we will hold you to that. I like, I love the idea of a Steve Vigo school. Um, it is also a serious indictment to all of us who are advocates of black consciousness that we do not have institutions, we do not have schools, you know, that are, are, are of our own creation, schools that are built, you know, from black consciousness. Um, Prof, it's also interesting that you mentioned that there is um, black consciousness in Zimbabwe. I think um, in 2013, yes, I think it was 2013, a few of us from Soweto went to Zimbabwe because we wanted to experience for ourselves, you know, what it looks like during the elections. And to our surprise, everyone thought that we were coming from the African National Congress. Nobody knew Biko, nobody knew Tieti Mashinini. We were so angry because we thought we were going to, you know, our fellow revolutionary um, um, comrades. But then, yeah, I suppose we just needed to find your office and that would have been a different thing. So Nabo, please, my brother, I think we have time for a few more questions. All right, thank you, Zandi. If I'm live, I can go. All right, thank you so much. Ikone Enye, APA, which is returning this course, and I suppose all Zandi will be in the liberty of translating that. It comes from Upumla from Forte, and I don't want to assume that it's Pumla Gola, but it's just Pumla from Forte. Professor Sesandi, where Nam Kulue Zizwe, Kauti Kata Ikiwa, Quin. Quindi ma ezaluanga manina nama koskazi kuile parishin ya se Afrika. Uibamba le prof. All right, ngo sega cool. And then we have a question as well from Utata Ukaya Matiso. It's a very straightforward question. Have we abandoned the idea of a patriotic front, a united movement of all black progressive? organization that comes from Ukaya Matiso. We have a question as well from Umashatze Manyatela. Was the Black Consciousness Movement a left wing of the ANC? That is the third question. And then the second last question coming from Ukoli Lepikiana. Greetings to all towers on this great day in Azania the day of commemorating and celebrating Ubig, all right, this seems to be a comment. Unokutula Shabangane, the last question. How then do we think of the university, its role, its horizons, its agenda, and the potentialities in this quest for this desired humanity, humanness that we ought 
to quest for? What is the role of the university in normalizing a move away from our, ourselves through its knowledge system and regime pro stroke protocols of being that inculcate the big man syndrome in Vered Kumas that is imperial in the in its spirit. Thank you, Zandi and the profs. Thank you so much, Sunwabo. Again, um, comrades, Professor Sasanti and Professor Mandaza, I think the, the question on the role of women in the African struggle comes from the first, um, it's, it's the first question. So that one will go to Professor Sisandi. But I do think that um, for purposes of being intentional in this conversation about the role of women, I think both professors should respond to this question because it's a very pressing question. So I'll take um, both professors' responses on this question. On the United Front, I think Comrade Mandaza, you'll be able to guide us there. And um, Professor Sisandi, the university and Bigo's quest for humanity. What is happening in that front? And finally, Sisandi, is the Bigo is Bigo or Black Consciousness or the Black Consciousness movement the left wing of 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 the African National Congress? I think as a former um, activist, you can take us through that as well. So let me allow Professor Ibo Mandaza to give us his thoughts on this question on the role of women as well as on the united front and then professor sandy you can come thereafter thank you just unmute yourself prof you need to unmute yourself prof please unmute yourself and and Re repeat what you've just said. Prof, just miss say, everything. I was just saying that the, the gender movement needs to be institutionalized across society, right from uh, school to university, into, into public life, into the, the whole uh, body politic, so to speak. Uh, the tendency so far is to see gender as a kind of an arm, a separate movement. Uh, I think we need to institutionalize it, mainstream it. Uh, I think a lot has been done in the last uh, uh, two decades, uh, but not enough. Not enough, and I think they, they, it, it, is, it is our women folk who have made their presence so poignant in our institutions that we, we rely upon. And I think many of us uh, have learned a lot from the women leadership in our own movements, especially in academia. But I think much more has to be done in political and social life and economic life, far much more. Prof, and your thoughts um, on this idea of a united front? The patriotic front. <laughs> the patriotic front was a term used in, in, uh, uh, in fact, some of us were involved in the formation of the patriotic front of Zimbabwe in, uh, in, 19, in, the, in the late 70s, which sought to unite uh, Zapu and Zanu. But as you know, the history of nationalist movements, the role of personalities and, 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 and the uh, the the nationalist ideology itself, uh, the focus on the big leader <laughs> is, has been a problem. And, and I think that the youth among us uh, should take the lead in this regard. Uh, the, but I think the question I was talking about a broader, and I, I think he imputes, he or she imputed the idea of, of a pan-African movement. I think that the Betok Front idea is embedded in the Pan-African movement. And I think we need to do more and say more. I mean, I, mean, I was very happy that uh, Professor Santik mentioned this is the 120th anniversary of the, of the Pan-African movement, you know, and the woman was a leader of that. Uh, 
I just think that we need to find a way of institutionalizing pan-Africanism in our schools, in our organizations. Uh, and when you hear of xenophobia and things like that, it, it just tells us how shallow so far uh, the pan-African movement has been on the continent in particular. Um, and I think organizations such as ZAPO remain very important in my view as a point of reminder just what the Pan-African movement is about. And we, as I said earlier on, we are finding ways to make Pan-African Pan -Africanist thought more meaningful in the setting up of, of a university. Uh, we should be a continent-wide, but also dealing with the di diaspora. So we can seek to put such issues as black consciousness, uh, the Steve Bicos of our country, we'll have, we'll have monuments to them in the university. So the younger generation can, can, can know where we've come, where we've come from. And I, I think that uh, there's no better way of pushing the idea implicit in the question of the Treaty Front then an, an emphasis on pan africans over and above national national interest, petty national interest. As, as Nkrumah said, you are not free until all Africa is free, until the black person is free. And this year, 2020, is a very important reminder and special today that we're still far from that. Absolutely. Without wasting time, thank you, Prof. Thank you so much. Um, Comrade Sandy Puduam Kaungen. Thank you very much, Program Director. Let me begin with the first question that was raised by Sis Pumla. And um, I would like to answer it on two levels. The first one is that, you know, in a self critical spirit, it needs to be pointed out that um, it is said that uh, since the 1972 um, occasion of Mamu Winihuare, um, you know, we have not had an elected president within the Black Consciousness Movement, except for, of course, we know that Osis uh, Nombulelo Mkefa in Cape Town, I mean, in Cape Town, yes, became the deputy, um, became the president of, um, you know, uh, Azapo after one uh, president uh, was pushed aside. Um, and those are the only two occasions, and it is not an issue that has been taken seriously. Um, and that, that reveals, you know, how much um, low our revolutionary consciousness is um, as those of us who, calls, who call ourselves revolutionaries. Because the truth of the matter is that if we do not give a sense um, that uh, mothers can be leaders, it also means women can be leaders. It, um, it, it shows that, you know, we are alienating a very powerful ally in the liberation struggle. It's a fact of the matter that, uh, you know, without Umamu Winnie Mandela keeping the fire burning, uh, Utatu Mandela would have been easily forgotten. That woman made a huge sacrifice in keeping the name of, Umamu, of Utatu Mandela alive. And we know, as you have said, Program Director, the role played by Umama o Obiko, you know, in supporting a son and the role that continues to be played um, by his wife, Umamu Nsiki. And so they play, you know, those revolutionaries. But I need to point out here very clearly that um, when o Amilka Cabral in the PAIGC sought to advance and highlight the importance of women's leadership, many men who called themselves revolutionaries actively undermined um, uh, Amilka Cabral. In, in, in Frelimo, in Mozambique, when, um, you know, um, 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 uh, Samora Masher made this effort, he was actively undermined. When Tabumbeki within the African National Congress sought to advance the importance of women's leadership, he was re ridiculed within the African National Congress. I do not see that debate taking place at all in the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania. And yet Mangaliso Sobukwe in the judgments of the PAC, uh, personal habit H, stated explicitly that uh, the women's dignity and uh, must be must be accorded a high level of respect so the, the my sense therefore is that there is an active resistance um to meaningful participation of women in the liberation struggle 
patriarchy has been entrenched in the minds of African men. They want to eat crumbles and alone from the table of their white masters. It is not a unique issue. It is something that has taken place also in the African-American struggle. Men that have been regarded as progressive in fighting racial discrimination have been very comfortable in gender discrimination. So it shows, therefore, that uh, we need serious mental liberation in this regard. We are far um, from getting to that point. Um, and as one, one example quickly, you know, there is nothing wrong with having contested um, the quest by Umamu Zuma to be the ANC president. But there was something very discomforting in, in the debates that took place there, that uh, instead of uh, looking at what she stood so they said that she was the pawn um, of, uh, of, uh, of Zuma, of her, of her husband, and yet conveniently forgetting that in the 2007 um, uh, election race of the ANC, um, Gosazana Zuma took an independent position and opposed the faction that was led by Jacob Zuma. So we conveniently forget this and say because she was carried a Zuma surname automatically. And that also raises an important point in terms of the of the cultural revolution for African women, that uh, they must take this into serious consideration, that uh, we must discard this Eurocentric uh, culture where women carry the names of their husbands as if women are the appendages. So therefore, you know, it must begin with the cultural liberation of African. In African culture, you look in African languages, when a man is going to marry, that woman is umlingane and equal. Mulika nika sisutu. So women, when they marry, they are, they are equals. Uh, and they are leaders in their own right. And we remember Umamu Ushalot Makaike, you know, she stated very clearly that uh, the leader, the men must not pretend to seek to want to liberate women when they themselves are not liberated. And perhaps we need even to examine this question of having women's leagues without men's leagues in organization because there's an assumption, a wrong assumption there that men, you know, are, are automatically liberated and empowered and yet they themselves need to be liberated from their own sense of inferiority complex, which manifests itself in the arrogance and the aggression that we see men perpetuating both inside and outside the liberation movements. Let me take a pause there quickly and go to the to the to the question of the, the role of the university uh, in terms of the, you know, the, the point, the reality of the matter is that uh, those of us who are educators have a choice to make. It's as simple as this. Gugi Wationgo said when he was speaking about writers in politics, he said that all writers were involved in politics, consciously or otherwise, they were pursuing a particular ideological orientation. It is the same with us as educators. We make a choice. Either we conform to the Eurocentric, um, you know, um, uh, status that is making us comfortable and that is, um, you know, um, those who feel threatened, uh, they are welcoming us as long as we do not uh, rock the boat. But we need to rock the boat um, at a philosophical level and, and begin to say, what is it that the university seeks to create an elite or to serve the interests of uh, our people? Because we know that traditionally and anciently, Africa, I mean, education was meant um, to liberate hum humankind and also to create godlike beings, compassionate human beings who understand. You know, as Comrade Ibo Mandaza raised an important issue earlier on about the capitalist mentality of our leaders. And we need to remind our people and our own educators that we need to inculcate and raise awareness that in terms of African culture, it is not what you have that matters. It is being, is, it counts more than having. And that is what we're supposed to be pursuing in terms of um, an Afrocentric, decolonized and decolonizing education. Thank you so much to both um, Professor Sisanti and Professor Mandaza. Am I audible? Okay, thank you. Um, I think the higher powers have been kind in terms of time. We still have time. Perhaps, Sonabo, we can take two more questions. Um, what our panels needs to understand is that 
we are connecting with over 900 people. So it would not be fair, you know, to only take seven questions, perhaps two more just to try balance. So Nabo, over to you. All right, thank you so much, Zandi, for highlighting that and reiterating that. Of course, we have more than 100 questions and comments at the moment, but at least um, some I've tried to integrate into one. There's one here coming from Isaac Shai. Um, Isaac Shai, the question is, how practical is it for a revolutionary to liberate an oppressor taking in account that generally the oppressor does not have a gene or of justice in their DNA. And then question number two, Zandi, what was Steve Biko's contribution in the economic front for South Africa and Africa as a whole? That one comes from Usiabonga. And maybe last one, I can just quickly chip in Umandi. Umandi is asking, how is Africa implicated in this and how should we Africa respond in our own best interest? So the comment was that the current Africa crisis and tragedy cannot be separated by global neo-imperialist interest and competition. How is Africa therefore implicated in this and how should we as Africans respond in our own best interest. Thank you, Zandile. Thank you, Brother Sunabo. Um, okay, let's do it this way again. Professor Ibo Mandaza, please take the question on Africa's crisis and how we respond to it in the context of Biko's um, idea of revolution. Um, Professor Sisanti, please take the first question from Isaac on how, what the, what the response, or is there a revolutionary responsibility to liberate the oppressor? And finally, perhaps both of you can weigh in on Bigo's philosophy on, on the economic front. So perhaps um, Professor Ibo Mandaza can start. Well, I think on the African crisis is precisely the subject of my lecture that, as Malcolm X said, until Africa becomes an equal partner in global affairs, uh, Africans and people of African descent the world over will remain at the bottom of the heap. Um, and, and, and therefore, the, 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 it's a very tall order at the moment to put into effect that which we have put in, in on paper we have come through 1978, the Lagos Plan of Action. We formed the SADC, uh, the PTA in 1978, SADC in 1980, the Abuja Treaty in 1993. We have all, we have all these things on. Uh, uh, we have. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, Prof. Oh, I'm just saying that we have on paper all the the the, uh, the beautiful uh, uh, papers on on how to get there but we're doing little for example the abuja treaty uh, uh, specifies that by by 2026 we would have an african economic community we're far from it so much more has to be done and i think the major factors that militate against uh, African unity and African economic uh, community has been threefold. The first is the vertical integration into the north. That's why the African crisis is largely a reflection of the crisis in capitalism in the north. We are vertically integrated and we compete for the attention of, of, of the northern hemisphere. We will queue up at the Paris Club, we will queue up at the IMF instead of going together as a bloc. Yes, standing as a block. And we have the uh, most embarrassing situation now where the African Union building in Addis Ababa was built by the Chinese. It is serviced by the Chinese. I was there two years ago. I refused to go in that building because it's, it's, it's an affront to our capacity as Africans. Uh, so it was, it was still very far. And I think we we have to do more than we have done so far and 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 and, and uh, the kind of discussions we're having here help 
but we need to institutionalize the process towards a genuine pan-Africanism, genuine African economic community. And I think our, our neo-colonial states, as they are at the moment, are hardly the kind of platform from which we can, we can, we can do that. Um, yes, I'll stop there. All right. Am I live? All right. Thank you so much. Looks like um, we have lost our moderator, however, I'm here. Thank you so much, Prof, for those inputs. I understand, Prof. Sandy, you have captured those two questions that were posed to you. I will hand over to you to respond to those. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Sirman. <clears throat> very quickly, let me make the point. Um, that is, uh, you know, that is um, that we are missing um, a, a great deal. And um, this being that in the revolutionary struggle, we must learn lessons at all times. One of the lessons that uh, we should have learned by now is that, uh, you know, the victories, however small that we secure, are not irreversible. We've got to understand that we are not engaging with forces that are passive. We are engaging with forces that are not only active, but forces that are very resourceful. And in their resourcefulness, they always look for allies within the liberation movement. And so that it happens that um, even those that we trusted have exposed themselves as not being conscious of the task that is ahead of us. And they were given some comforts and all that. And because uh, they did not have the consciousness that is necessary for the revolution, they have fallen into those traps. And so what then, you know, stands ahead of us is that those who are interested in the genuine liberation of the African people have got to understand that uh, they must study the history of the African continent and the, and the histories of the struggles of the world. Because when you don't have a sense and a consciousness of history, uh, you do not have a clear idea um, of the challenges that you face. No Fanon um, that we keep on. I, I'm amazed when I read the book, uh, Franz Fanon, and he was so young when he passed when he was 36. Uh, but Fanon was very insightful and he had learned all the intricacies and the enemies of the of the of the of the of the colonialist forces. And he realized um, that uh, they had so much at their disposal. They had not only money, but psychologists, this and this and this and that. And that now as we move forward, we must be strategic. And I'm not ingratiating myself or even praising um, uh, Professor Mandaza here. But I know that uh, in the 80s when we were in Zim, in the early 90s, um, he took a conscious decision to establish the South African People's Economic Monthly. Now, that was our monthly diet. If we had not read SAPEM, we knew that we had not read anything. And so there was an institution. And what we don't understand is that, you know, we need to have institutes and institution that are dedicated to intellectual development. Because once we have, and now we, the problem with us is that we think that uh, intellectualization is a thing of the elite. Intellectualization is very important. We've got, we've got to have a clear understanding. We are not going to get where we need to get to unless we have a very clear, understanding of the concepts and the issues that we're dealing with because you know you you examine the literature of those who are opposing us they read deep war they read fanon they read cabra they read all of them we we concern ourselves merely with just reading a statement that was made by 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 cabra it said tell no lies claim no easy victories and beyond that we cannot go when we say fanon fanon said that uh, you know every uh, generation has got its uh, mission it's up to that generation uh, to fulfill its mission or betray it and it ends there we've got to st st struggle means understanding issues in a deep way. The reason that we're in the mess that we're in is that we have looked for slogans and did not understand the huge task in front of us. Quickly then, uh, back to Isaac Shai's um, question. Um, the, the point here is, the truth of the matter is that um, we must understand that uh, the, the oppressor is his or her own oppressor. It is not possible that you can keep a person down without being down with that person. Amy is uh, taught us that uh, in the when when the, the oppressor was dehumanizing us, the oppressor was equally dehumanizing dehumanizing his or her own self. So that um, as he and she was being inhumane to us, 
he and she were destroying their own human capacity. And so therefore, um, because we, we seek to do better, you know, um, African people in their conscious revolutionary consciousness, uh, our leaders taught us that um, as we seek uh, to liberate African people, we also seek to liberate the entire humankind. In doing this, we are not asking for our enemies to love us. We are not asking our enemies to be kind to us. We are not asking for anything from them. We do what we do for our own selves. If um, they do not want to take that, it's their business. Ours is simply to advance and to push the justice agenda. Um, and we do this mostly and especially for those who are from the receiving end. They are bound to be arrogant at the moment because they still have comfort. But when that comfort is taken from them, they are going to be human, just like all of us. Thank you indeed, Elder Sasanti. Um, I'm very much happy to say that black consciousness has been challenged, you know. We are challenged to raise the bar. Um, without wasting much time, let me allow Comrade um, Bishop from Azapo to give us today's closing remarks. Um, over to you, Comrade. I hope the tower is ready. I don't see him on the screen. Tower, okay. are you ready? Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you to the management of the uh, this university. Thank you to the professors and everybody who is listening. It is with pleasure to realize that on the 43rd anniversary of Steve's death, people are still aware of what needs to be done. If we look around, there's a lot of activism that is going on on this particular day because of the nature of the character that we're talking about, the father of the black consciousness movement. Comrade Steve Biko is one phenomenon that uh, when you look back, he is of the caliber of Christ if one is a Christian, because at the 33 Christ had done everything and then he was killed. So such people, we needed to take advantage of what they've taught us and what they've left us with. Their legacy lives on. Again, let me just say, this has been an eye-opener to a lot of young people. And we intend that institutions, and we intend going to the Department of Basic Education so that they must, include this as a part of their uh, curriculum. Because the history that the, our kids are taught, it's not ours. It makes them foreigners in the country of their own birth. Again, there is a saying in Isikosa, today we are commemorated Comrade Steve's death just Yesterday, yesterday is the last night that comrade have been taken from Warmer Police Station. Then to, this story is not told, to Royal, or what is known as a Northern Prison. At about midnight, the sirens at the prison rang. When he was brought in, there were he was between these big enemies. They were dragging him. His leg couldn't take that power. Fortunately, we were in the cells on the passage, so we could see what has happened. And at five in the morning, he stayed for five hours there, those sirens rang again, and then he was taken back to the police van. This is part of the history. That is not told. So we are very happy that today 
we reveal some of these things because the people are taking what they are given. For instance, if you look around, you'll see your newspapers, you'll see your, your televisions and what, it will be a line or two comments, two lines comment. But you are happy that this relationship between black consciousness as up in particular with this university, it's a living and it's a relationship that is not going to end. And we want to thank you wholeheartedly for that. Then I've mentioned the question of if Anangos. It is with sadness to announce that yesterday, one of the leaders of Azapo in this region in particular, Comrade Mbuiseli, popularly known as Naruki Masati, has passed on. May his soul rest in peace. So he's the one who's going before Steve. So we want to thank you on behalf of Azapo and all Black Consciousness family. And we want to say thank you to the Azanian masses. They must understand that we are in the mess that we are in because of choice. If people were conscious really and followed what to be stood for, wouldn't be having a settlement that we got. That sellout settlement as a Camden Park. Thank you very much. And may God bless you. Thank you so much for those closing remarks. I want to, because I consider myself a member of Azapo, um, even though I don't carry a, a, a card, a membership card, so I think I can give a very quick critique. Bigot died at a very young age. He was 30, 33 years old. And I expected Tower to see a young face. I expected to see someone who's younger to come and give us the, the closing remarks. But it comes from a good place. Um, I think I understand, of course, why we don't have a lot of young people in Azapo today. Um, Azapo continues to be a band movement, you know. We have not left the 1977 Black Wednesday moment because the systematic attack on Black consciousness has not stopped. It continues in the democratic dispensation. So perhaps I'm not saying my critique without understanding the internal dynamics um, in terms of what has happened to the ideas of Black consciousness and the vehicle, um, which is Azapo, which continues to fight to keep these ideas relevant. But I think I want to again appreciate the contribution made by both Professor Mandaza and Professor Sisanti. A takeaway point for me, perhaps comrades in closing, is the idea that we need to use Bigo as a symbol of unity. Then there is enough, I think, among those of us who are advocating for black consciousness to actualize this unity. And unity does not mean uniformity. Instead, it means mobilizing black people under one roof through programs. And Professor Ibo Mandaza, I like the idea of a school. I will keep reiterating that so that the whole of Azana knows. I think something like that could be used as a symbol of unity because like U Utawa said, our current schools do not teach our children about anything that is pro-black. Therefore, having a bigger school um, not only in Ginsberg, but in various places in Azania, even outside um, Azania, seem to me to be the fitting program to articulate this um, unity that I'm talking about. Um, we have come to the end of our conversation. Of course, the conversation only ends here virtually. I know it will continue um, beyond the space. It will continue in our communities as we go out there to do the work that we go um, instructed us to do 43 years ago. Um, I would like to leave it here. Thank you for um, being with us until this moment. And we are grateful that um, ESCOM did not disrupt us. Everything went well. Of course, this shows that Biko is here and is bigger than all these challenges that we are facing. Siabule <laughs> Is there no song? How do we close this thing? You know, these virtual things. There are no songs. There are no pictures. What is happening, Sonabo? We are finished. <laughs>